today's episode we are going to look at some of the folklore and fairy lore that surrounds the incredibly beautiful white thorn tree, also known as the hawthorn and the fairy tree. A tree with associations to deep femininity, goddesses, women's rituals, fertility, beauty, magic and sensuality. The other names this enchanting and enchanted tree is known by are quick thorn, thorn apple, the quick, hawberry, the beltane tree and the may tree. Indeed it is the may blossom that is one of the signs that spring is definitely with us. Near cast a clout till may is out says the folk crime, and though this can refer to the month, it actually speaks of the may flower. Never remove too many clothes until the may blossom has bloomed. Naturally, this being the may tree, it is associated with the Sabbath of Beltane, and spring, and fertility and love and blessings upon the land, fruitfulness, hope and love. And yet there is a dark association with the tree also, as there is with all things magical and fairy. The light and the dark need each other for balance. The root name of the hawthorn comes from the old English word haw, meaning hedge, coming from the Anglo-Saxon hagathorn, a fence with thorns. They can grow as tall as 50 foot, but mostly they are kept a small tree by nature. Shrubby, often found in hedgerows and where farm gates meet the hedges, these are liminal trees, thriving in liminal spaces, edge lands and edge places where strange things happen, where fairy folk dwell. These twisting fairy tale trees also have a habit of standing alone, weathered and so beautiful in fields or open moorlands, and it is these strange solitary trees that are respected even today as fairy trees strange, watchful and other, and I shall tell you more of these in a moment. The hawthorn, the white thorn, is a hardy tree, tough, it is a pioneer tree, growing first where none other will grow, paving the way for other species to follow. Indeed, it began its spread in the Neolithic, during the forest clearances of that time. They can live for over 400 years, and yet even younger trees take on an elderly twisting and unusual fairy tale appearance. They are full of character, and very inspiring to we artists. The hawberry is a hugely important part of the food gathering in winter for birds and animals, and is also used by certain birds in a most peculiar way, and also quite gruesome. Another name for the white thorn is the butcher's larder, and this refers to the butcher bird, the shrike. Shrikes are a very beautiful bird, but with an odd habit of creating larders of caught prey that they impale on spines of trees. The white thorn with all its thorns is one of their favourite trees to create their larders. A most fascinating and macabre bird indeed. The haw of the common hawthorn, the berry, is also gathered by we humans to make the loveliest hawthorn berry jams and jellies and also hawthorn wine, which a friend of mine does make and it is beautiful. The berries being collected very carefully because of the thorns and usually after the first frosts. The first early frosts of winter act upon the berries, turning some of the fruit's starch to sugar, leaving a superior taste for winemaking. The fruits can even be mashed, the little pips removed and the skins also, and the remaining pulp dried to create a form of fruit jerky. Even the leaves of this tree and the early flower buds of this tree are edible. In spring, when the leaves are tender and young, a wonderful wild addition to salads. In the southwest of England, on Dartmoor, the hawthorn has more names. Eagleberry, agle and pixie pears and chuck cheese. 
The belief is that the Chuck Cheese name refers to the flavour of the young leaves. Children would gather them and eat them as a cheesy tasting treat. The tradition of gathering and preserving whole berries stretches across all of our beautiful planet. It is a nutritional addition to diets in the colder months. In Mexico, the berries are used in pre-Christmas piñatas in the Las Posadas celebration and they are also served along with other fruits in Christmas punch. A tradition that surely predates this festivity as many traditions do. The sweet treat relitos, also found in Mexico, have whole berries as one of their ingredients. In Iran, the fruits are eaten raw and also preserved. In China, these berries grow slightly larger than ours and are used as sweets coated in sugar. The berries are also preserved in this country and also used in alcoholic drinks and sauces. It is a very useful international tree indeed. The white thorn tree is a tree of protection. There is a tradition of gathering flower branches from the hawthorn for decorations outside the house on the 1st of May. A very ancient tradition indeed. Huge swathes of flower branches would be cut and placed in the ground around the home or even the farm and outbuildings. These may bushes would then be decorated further with wild flowers from the meadows and the hedgerows. The trees are said to protect the house from lightning strike, which today seems a peculiar worry. But in a time when most homes and cottages were created with thatched reed roofs, the walls made from wooden frames, cob, mud and straw walls, the fear would have been very real. In parts of the world where houses are made from these materials, it is still a great worry. For example, our former home was a thatched cottage dating back to the mid 1600s. Every time we had a thunderstorm we did worry that our house or the village electricity posts that were quite nearby might get hit and the sparks would set the roof on fire. It's just something that you think about when you live in such an old country cottage. Because of the protective aspect of the hawthorn, there was a strong superstition about never harming the tree. However, there is a dread of bringing the branches inside the home, as it could bring bad luck and ill fortune to the household. This seems to be a common theme with trees and plants that are classed as magical and fairy. And yet there is also a tradition in Scotland that to have sprigs gathered in the month of May and place around the house and outbuildings will banish evil spirits and also witches. The most common tradition though is that the branches and flowers should be hung around and above the door outside for protection, but always ask the spirit of the tree for permission first. In Ireland, a little of the first milk of a cow that had just given birth to a calf was collected and poured in offering beneath the white thorn fairy tree as tribute to the fairy folk. This was an important tradition as fairies are renowned for their love of fresh milk and certain of the good folk will help themselves to milk from the cattle if they feel they want to. The white thorn is also a symbol of love and hope. It is still used today in ritual hand fastings as one of the symbolic trees. To have some white thorn will ensure that the marriage will be strong and enduring. In ancient Greece, those who were part of wedding ceremonies and processions would carry sprigs of the hawthorn and indeed the white thorn was also used to decorate altars to the god Hymen, one of the gods of marriage ceremonies one of the winged gods of love and sexuality, the Erotes, that surrounded the goddess Aphrodite. It was poetry inspired by his name and he himself that was sung as the bride walked to the groom's home and the bride would wear a crown made from white thorn on her wedding day. The phrase to carry a torch for a person, as in to have strong feelings for someone, comes from the classical ancient tradition of the white thorn being used as the wedding torch, lighting the way for the bride and groom. And yet, 
Despite the association with the month of May, it was considered bad luck at that time to marry during this month. In some countries, marrying in May is still frowned upon. In both Roman and Greek folklore, the white thorn was a symbol of purification. Purity, chastity, and parts of the hawthorn were collected to be crafted into charms and talismans that would protect the purity and virginity of young women. In the Roman era, the white thorn was one of the trees associated strongly with the goddess Flora. The goddess of hinges and doorways of all things, Cardea, also features white thorn in her folklore. She was said to use hawthorn for her spells, and branches of her tree were hung over the windows and doors where a new baby slept, in protection against the evil that may be drawn to the infant's energy. As a goddess of the doorways, the hawthorn would enhance Cardea's enchantments. Other goddesses associated with the white thorn are Persephone, among whom it was seen as a symbol of hope, the Celtic goddess Aina, who I spoke of in a previous episode of the Lian and She, the goddess Breed, or Bridget, Hecate, Chloris, Maya, and the Celtic god Manana Maclear. Hawthorn blossom sprigs collected as talismans of hope and love would be collected at the Beltane Festival on the 1st of May by young women who would keep it nearby. It was believed that this would attract a good husband. Bringing home the May on this day was considered a fertility ritual. In the Victorian era, they looked upon this beautiful tree as representing hope in the Victorian language of flowers. On Beltane morning, young men and women would congregate at the white thorn trees to wash and bathe themselves in the dew that had gathered on the hawthorn. It was said that to do this would bring the blessings of good luck, health, wealth, beauty. The women who did this ritual would become so beautiful, and the men would be able to carry out their handcrafts with a skill that they had never had before. Often the ritual bathers would be given blessings by a chosen individual dressed to represent the green man, another figure from folklore who represents the fertility and the blessings of this time of year. The Beltane May festivities would of course include the ritual dancing around the maypole, and this is sometimes seen as something quite quaint in today's times. Yet, ritual dancing in many cultures around the world and in many religions is a very powerful way of connecting to spirits, faith, hope, the gods and the goddesses. And this would have been no different to the ancient cultures who danced around the Maypole originally. Traditionally, the central shaft of the pole would be created from the trunk of a male hawthorn tree, and the crown of the pole decorated with the branch and the flowers from the female white thorn. The ribbons are connected at the top of the pole and the dancers weave intricate patterns while holding the ribbons and dancing around the central pole. To anyone of a pagan faith, this is obviously spell weaving and honoring, asking blessings, creating webs and patterns and also possibly with the repetitive circular motions and dance almost entering a trance-like state that enhances the magic. Well, that's my theory anyway, but it does chime with other ritual dances from old cultures that still carry out traditions and hold ritual dances sacred. Traditional Beltane festivals, a queen of the May is chosen, a beautiful and young woman, and she is honoured goddess-like. Beautiful sprays of May Blossom, the White Thorn, the Hawthorn are taken to decorate the May Queen and these armfuls of pretty flowering branches are then traditionally taken from house to house and barn to barn to share in the blessings of the White Thorn magic. An old English rhyme tells us, the fair maid who on the 1st of May goes to the fields at break of day and bathes in the dew from the Hawthorn tree will ever strong and handsome be. And there is another rhyme which says, many nits, many pits, many sloans, many groans, many aggles, many cradles, which seems to mean many nits, 
nuts, many pits, graves, many sloans, the slow berries, many groans, many eagles, which we know from before was another way of saying the hawthorn, many cradles. And this seems to tell us that if the hawthorn and all the other things have many berries, then many babies will follow that year. In the Celtic tree alphabet and calendar called Ogham, Hawthorn represents the sixth letter of the alphabet in the sixth month of the year, and in this tradition this makes it the last weeks of May, when the blossom is at its fullest. In the language it is called Hwatha, and it is the letter H. Each tree and letter, each monthly period, also has powers and enchantments associated with it. For Watha, the Hawthorn, these are fertility, protection, relaxation, happiness, hope, caution and chastity. The Watha is also associated with the Hag Goddess and sexuality. In ritual magic practices that involve the trees, where parts of certain trees would be used to draw the essence of the magic of that particular plant or tree into the ritual, the Hawthorn has an association to Mars, with the principal action of the tree being the god Mars's warlike nature, his masculinity and sexuality. Of course, when gathering parts of the tree for this purpose, an offering of thanks to the spirit of the tree is always left after a gathering. It is interesting how many ancient traditions from all over the world have the very same or the very similar talismanic, magical or symbolic associations with tree and plant law. There is a Christian tradition that the crown of thorns worn by Christ was made from white thorn, and it is thought that this is the origin of the French folklore tradition that the white thorn tree cries and weeps on Good Friday. The association with Christ and the cross would also have enhanced the common folk superstition that bad luck would befall anyone who uprooted and destroyed a hawthorn tree. In Glastonbury in the southwest of England there is another Christian legend about the white thorn. Outside this very beautiful town, a place of so much Arthurian legend and fairy lore and esoterica, there once stood a lone hawthorn tree that was visited by Christian pilgrims from all over the world, and also lovers of mysteries and medieval history. This thorn tree is said to have originated from the planting of the white thorn walking staff of Joseph of Arimathea, the man who took charge of the burial of Christ after his execution, and he was said to have become a Christian missionary. He carried with him the Holy Grail. The place Joseph was sent to spread the word was Albion, England, and on his travels he came to Glastonbury. He placed his staff in the earth on the side of a hill. We are weary all, he is supposed to have sighed, and at that moment, miraculously, the staff took root. It grew into a fine tree. The tree flowered twice every year, a real beauty, and a winter flowering white thorn was also considered a miracle. From that day the legend says the hill became known as Weary All Hill, and it is called that even today. In the aftermath of the English Civil War, which pitted royalists against parliamentarians, family against family, brother against brother, the original Holy Thorn was destroyed. It had been associated with the royalty of England, vows of it being sent to the king to use as decorations. Because of this, when the parliamentarians took control of the country and the king was killed, the poor tree had no chance. And yet it returned, and has been replanted many times after many, many destructive episodes. In the 1950s, a tree was happily growing at the place when someone attacked it, cutting off its branches. Shoots reappeared, but just as quickly these were removed. In 2012, a sapling of the original pre-1950s tree was planted in place of the destroyed one, and this was also consecrated. Sixteen days later, the sapling was snapped in half, killing it. 
In 2019, the landowner on which the damaged remains of this tiny tree stood removed all that was left of the holy thorn. To this day, no one knows or will admit to knowing who was the cause of the destruction. Ironically and quite sadly, this was done in the month of May. A sad and pointless end to a beautiful legend. Westminster Abbey in London sits upon the site of a once great copse of white thorn trees known as Thorny Island. The habit of placing Christian places of worship at sites of pagan worship was an obvious thing to take advantage of. The worship could continue at a familiar place, at a familiar time of the year or month. The only thing different would be the faith and the stories that were told there and so it was easier to convert the people, keeping so much familiarity. It is the same reason that we see so many yew trees in churchyards in northern Europe, as the yew was also a place of pagan worship. White thorn has been an important part of folk medicine for centuries if not longer. A peculiar use of the hawthorn is in Serbia, where its wood is essential in the killing of vampires. The stakes used to pierce the heart of the evil creature must be made of white thorn, which is ironic really as in other European countries the hawthorn is said to heal broken hearts. Medicinally the berries, leaves and flowers have been a constant in the hedgerow healer's collection of herbal cures and folk medicines. These parts of the tree are said to give balance to blood pressure and strength to the blood circulation and the heart. The berries and leaves are very rich in nutrition and vitamins and as such have been a useful part of the poor folks diet stretching back in time and it is thought even as far back as the Neolithic. As a tonic for improving the heart and blood pressure an infusion was crafted that could be taken and this has even been used to help with Reno's disease and poor memory due to the increased circulation. But, of course, these things must be tried very carefully and with the help of herbalists with experience of medical matters. It is said that the hawthorn's bioflavonoids can relax the arteries and are valuable antioxidants that can help repair tissue damage. The hawthorn, when used as a medicine, can help with anxiety and depression and help emotional healing as well. The hawberries used to be, and sometimes still are, collected to use fresh or dried and infused and steeped in brandy to make a heart and circulation tonic that can be used in the cold months of winter. In history the berries were dried and crushed to a powder, dissolved in wine and drank to aid with gallstones and dropsy. In Devon, in the southwest of England there was collected a marvellous folk remedy and it was recorded thus. In using this, the charmer hung a branch of white thorn on a wall without allowing it to touch the ground. She then took nine small pieces of different coloured cloths tied in a bunch and some raw cream. The patient sat under a thorn, the bits of cloth were dipped into the cream and dapped upon the inflamed area. It must be done 5, 7, 9, 11, 13 or any number of times. Another tradition tells that should a calf be born prematurely, its afterbirth should be hung in the boughs of the white thorn tree. This will bring a blessing of magic to the little animal, bringing health, strength and a speedy growth. In Lancashire in the northwest of England, the hawthorn was used for that seemingly most common of ailments, the curing of warts. Really, warts must have been rife in the medieval era and onwards, because wart cures are many -er and incredibly varied. Anyway, back to our Lancashire folk cure. The wart-ridden person should capture a small black snail, rub the wart with the snail and then impale the poor creature on a hawthorn spine. I presume, as the snail withered and died, the wart itself would wither and disappear in an act of sympathetic magic. A warning poem that was once popular for those weather watching and predicting was many whores, many slows, many cold toes, referring to the white thorn and the black thorn trees, 
the haws of the white thorn and the sloes of the black thorn. Should there be a large crop, the winter would be harsh. The blackthorn is another incredibly magical tree, dark and mysterious, and as somewhat folkloric sister to the white thorn, this tree will be the subject of my next episode of tree lore, but more of that another time. And now we come to the curious and ancient clouties. The hawthorn tree is a tree of hope and wishes, and since time beyond time, a tree of offerings. These are called the clouty or clouty trees. These lone hawthorns stand by holy wells, magical springs, often associated with fairy lore and goddess folklore, and most usually healing. How far this stretches back into ancient history who can tell, but it seems to me to be possibly associated with ancient tree worship. Part of this tradition and how it has come to develop even into today is the clouty tree. Clouties and their associated springs and wells have a strange atmosphere of other. You can feel it in the atmosphere, it's almost tangible. We made a trip to the Clouty and Holy Well at Madron in Cornwall, one of the most famous of these trees. As we approached the area, it was as though the density of the atmosphere had changed. We took photos all the way and of the well and the sentinel clouty tree with its ribbon and jewellery and paper offerings that danced in the gentle breeze. Every single photo that we took was sharp as we expected from our cameras. The clouty tree images though are full of orbs of light. I don't know if I believe in orbs as spirits, but these things are peculiar in that there was no rain, no drizzle, no dust. The photos, right up to the tree and right after, have not one single little ball of light or whatever it might be. It's a mystery. Back to the folklore of the Whitethorn Cloudy. At Belton, that may time of the Hawthorn's most power, the people of Ireland would hang their ribbons in the local hawthorn trees, especially near wells or springs, making wishes, asking for the blessings of St Bridget. Strips of bandage and cloth that could be used in healing later in the year were hung and then taken down. Of course we heard earlier that the hawthorn is associated with the goddess Bridget, sanctified becoming a healing saint. The ribbons and cloth tied to the branches represent the types of wishes and asked for blessings. For example, blue for health, red and pink for love, green or gold for wealth and success. And there was a saying in Ireland that went with this tradition. When all fruit fails, welcome haws. When all else fails, ask the hawthorn tree. Offerings to the fairies would also be left at or beneath the fairy trees at the hawthorns. The wood of the white thorn is extremely hard. It is very close grained, so perfect for making hand tools, handles, small carved items to treasure. It is good for wood turning, but its most common use was as a hedging material. The name of the tree denotes its usefulness. Its Latin name is Crataegus monogyna. The first word is rooted in the Greek kratos, which means strong. It is a strong and hardy tree indeed for such a pretty one. The berries are known as haws, and this comes from the Anglo-Saxon haga, translating as hedge, an enclosure. It is said though that you must never cut the branches, but collect those that the tree has dropped naturally. A hawthorn should never be harmed, or bad fortune will come to he or she who has damaged the trees. These fallen branches are mostly found in winter, when older branches just do not survive the storms and rough winds. The wood burns very hot, and so makes a great fuel, and it is also good for making into charcoal. On Dartmoor in Devon in the southwest of England, a rhyme says, Hawthorn logs are good to last, catch them in the fall. In Ireland a tradition is that if your neighbour is herding cattle using a white thorn staff, he or she is up to no good. What on earth that means, I have no idea, 
but it sounds really great. And so we come to some negative folklore of the white thorn. As with all things in life, along with the good comes the bad. We can't have light without shadow to contrast it with. In 1627, Francis Bacon wrote his book Silver Sivarum in that he described the scent of hawthorn as smelling like the plague. This is very interesting. The pretty flowers of the white thorn exude a large amount of trimethylamine, the first chemical that forms after a mammal has died. And this has a faint scent of decaying fish, a ghost of the scent of death. Country folk also regarded the smell of the blossom as smelling of death. And if we think about the tradition of keeping the body of a loved one on display or stored in the house until burial that still goes on in some countries, the people would have and still will have a keen sense of this scent. This is probably another reason why the bringing of Hawthorne inside the house was considered unlucky, possibly actually bringing about death in the coming year. An attractor maybe. In 1946, Alison Utley in Country Things told that Hawthorne was never brought into the house during the month of May. Indeed, it was never taken into our rooms. There was a strong feeling against it in every cottage and farmhouse, for it was a portent of death in that year. Innocent children who had been picking flowers were often scolded for not thinking and simply bringing them into the house as they're such pretty flowers, but it was just not worth the risk. Even the poet Ted Hughes wrote that the hawthorn blossom had a nauseous, sweet, aniseed scent. And we come to fairy folklore. These trees are synonymous with fairies, especially where there are random lone trees twisted into story-like creatures and the atmosphere of these trees is simply well, enchanting in the truest scent of the word. In many folklores, these trees mark doorways or portals to the fairy world, the other world, especially those growing near water, streams or on fairy forts and hills, standing alone and seeming strange in the middle of fields or moorlands. But fairy portals could be anywhere where these trees grow really. In Ireland, the trees growing on the fairy hills are known as the sacred trees of the fort, and hawthorns do seem to be peculiarly common at these places there. The trees were also meeting places where battling members of the good folk would gather to fight. Strange white or green substances that were found beneath and around these trees were thought to be the blood left behind following the battles of the fairies. I have already told you of the superstition surrounding the destruction or harming of whitethorn trees, and this fear and respect extends to fairy lore also. With their habit of growing alone, sentinel in fields and such, they often, well, they get in the way of what humans would consider progress. For centuries, especially in the fairy field Isle of Ireland, these trees were respected so much as places sacred to the fairies that they would never be touched, harmed or removed. Work would carry on around them, roads would respectfully go by them, certainly not through where they were growing. After the destruction of fairy trees, people have heard the wailing of the fairies, crying and mourning their death and loss. There have been sightings of them taking the cut branches from carts or fires trying to save their lives. Some trees that have been planned for removal have even literally disappeared overnight. I shall tell you some tales of the dangers of harming these fairy white thorns. First one of the most famous, which was fought for by the incredible and much respected fairy folklorist and storyteller Eddie Lenahan, who I consider a hero of folklore collection and preservation. A link to his YouTube channel is at the bottom of Tales of Fae and Folk main page. There is a hawthorn tree called the Latoon Bush in County Clare. In 1999, a new motorway was being built through this area and the fairy tree was right in the path of the road. 
the Latoon Bosch was scheduled for removal and destruction. Now, this Bosch is respected as a marker point on a fairy path, a place where the fairy folk of Kerry would gather while on their way to their battles with the fairy folk of Kanak. Eddie Lenehan fought for the life of this tree, warning that ill luck and danger would follow the destruction of the tree, not just for the builders and those working on the motorway, but also for any driver who had to pass over this spot while on the new road. The battle was won on behalf of the fairy folk, and the road now flows around this tree sacred to the fairies, and sacred to the history of Ireland also. The folklorist Bob Curran also considers the destruction of these fairy trees dangerous. He ponders if the destruction of a fairy hawthorn by John DeLorean aided in the complete collapse of the DeLorean Motor Company. The builders, working on his factory in Ireland, were wary and worried about destroying the fairy tree that was in the way of the proposed factory and refused to touch it. In the end, DeLorean himself bulldozed the tree to the ground. Of course, bad planning, bad management and rather, let us say, peculiar practices brought about the collapse of the DeLorean Motor Company, but I am pretty sure that the destruction of the fairy tree did not help matters at all. What is interesting is that it shows that even into modern times, there is still awareness of fairy trees. The Irish Folklore Commission has accounts of the superstitions and fears surrounding the harming of white thorn trees, and I shall tell you now just a few of the tales that they have collected in this incredible archive. The old people say the fairies live in these forts. I often took a fishing rod from one and nothing ever happened to me. The old people told me about a man's arm going powerless from cutting down a certain tree. There was a man cutting down a tree which was a fairy tree, and he shivered to death. It is said that a man named John Judge cut a fairy brush in Kulnar, and that all the hair fell off his head. It is said that if anyone cut a fairy bush, they would lose the hand which they would cut it with. A man named Thomas Moorhead of Kilakenna went to cut a lone bush or a fairy bush, and with the first blow with which he gave it with the axe, his nose began to bleed and he got a pain in his head, and he was confined to bed for three weeks afterwards. There is a fairy bush out on our hill, and it is said that if you would dare break a leaf of it, that something bad will happen to you. There is an old tree in the townland of Brookloon. It is known as the fairy tree of Bowery Bush. A man once cut a branch from the tree to stop a gap. One night later on, this man was returning home from rambling, when a man walked out from under the fairy tree and ordered the other man to put it back, which he did there and then. He was told by the spirit that he must never touch the fairy tree or lone bush. The spirit then disappeared, and to this day, no one would dare touch the tree, lest he be taken away in the fairies. There is a tree that stands in Boris Little. Some years ago, part of it lay across the road. Captain Chemist could not pass with his carriage and horses. He decided to hire a man to cut the tree. No man around the locality would cut the tree. He cut the tree and got a pound for cutting it. He only lived five day afterwards. It is said to be a fairy tree. The trunk of it stands to this day. The man's arm withered before he died. W.B. Yeats, not just a supreme poet, but also a great collector of fairy folklore and folk belief, gathered poems and tales that spoke of the white thorn and its magical associations. He collected the tale of Tinker, Pat Driver, and his escape from certain death by hiding in a hawthorn tree, and also the poem of the disappearance of Anna, a young maiden who was tempted to join the fairy dancing while by a hawthorn. Thomas the Rhymer, the 13th century Scottish favourite of the fairy queen, 
a mystic, a cunning man and a poet, met the Queen of Fairies by a white thorn in the boughs of which a cuckoo was calling. As with many tempted by the beguiling attractions of the fey folk, he was persuaded to follow her into the realm for a while, to amuse her, to love and be loved. However, once he was allowed back to the human world, he found he had been gone seven years, the frightening missing time occurrence that I have discussed in the episode about the dangers of fairy music and dancing. He was lucky it was only seven years. Michael Dacre, in his brilliant book Devonshire Folk Tales, has a very interesting account told to him and his wife of a temporary kidnapping by the fairies from underneath a hawthorn tree by the actual victim herself when she was a small child. The legend of the beguiling of Merlin the wizard features the white thorn, although the tree in the tale is sometimes referred to as an apple. But here we will tell the tale as the white thorn, as the hawthorn. The fairy maiden Nimue, or Vivian, was a student of Merlin. She was eager to learn all she could from the master wizard and cunning man. She would be the wisest, most learned, and yet she always felt that he was holding back knowledge from her. She tried every trick she knew to have him teach her all his secrets, until eventually Merlin could take no more. He fled his place of learning and teaching and made his way to the enchantingly beautiful land of Brittany, to Brosseliande. But Nimue followed him. She found him hiding in a white thorn tree, a fairy tree by the fountain of Barenton. She enticed him and wooed him, caressed him with sweet soft words, plied him with her womanly gifts until eventually the man surrendered. She had one question for him. What would be the spell to hold a man captive? He spoke the words, enchanted by this beautiful and intelligent young woman. As soon as the last word had left his lips, she cast that same spell and Merlin found himself trapped, resting for an eternity in the boughs of the hawthorn. Breton folk would visit the fountain to ask for rain in times of need after this day. They would gather some of the water in vessels and throw it upon the large stone slab that stands nearby. And this place still stands in the wild woods of Brasseliander in Pampon. I will leave you with a couple of very short poems dedicated to the white thorn tree. Mark the fair blooming of the hawthorn tree, who finely clothed in a robe of white, fills the wanton eye with May's delight. Hawthorn, white and odorous with blossom, framing the quiet fields and swaying flowers and grasses under the hum of bees. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I had a lot of fun gathering all the folklore for this one and learned a lot as well in the process. If you enjoyed this episode, please do click like and please consider subscribing to the channel. Thank you so much to those who already have. Your support means a lot. So, until next time, dear friends, as always, keep well, brightest of blessings, and remember, don't play with the fairy folk, or you may end up in one of my folk tales yourself.